before we name this other spectator. Let us pause here a moment, in order to recall our own impression, as previously described, of the discordant and incommensurable elements in the nature of Esclean tragedy. Let us think of our own astonishment at the chorus and the tragic hero of that type of tragedy, neither of which we could reconcile with our practices any more than with tradition, till we rediscovered this duplexity itself as the origin and essence of Greek tragedy, as the expression of two interwoven artistic impulses, the Apollonian and the Dionysian. To separate this primitive and all-powerful Dionysian element from tragedy, and to build up a new and purified form of tragedy on the basis of a non-Dionysian art, morality, and conception of things. Such is the tendency of Euripides which now reveals itself to us in a clear light. In a myth composed in the eve of his life, Euripides himself most urgently propounded to his contemporaries the question as to the value and signification of this tendency. Is the Dionysian entitled to exist at all? Should it not be forcibly rooted out of the Hellenic soil? Certainly, the poet tells us, and if only it were possible. But the god Dionysus is too powerful. His most intelligent adversary, like Pentheus in the Bacchae, is unwittingly enchanted by him, and in this enchantment meets his fate. The judgment of the two old sages, Cadmus and Tiresias, seems to be also the judgment of the aged poet. That the reflection of the wisest individuals does not overthrow old popular traditions, nor the perpetually propagating worship of Dionysus, that in fact it behooves us to display at least a diplomatically cautious concern in the presence of such strange forces. Where, however, it is always possible that the god may take offense at such lukewarm participation, and finally change the diplomat, in this case Cadmus, into a dragon. This is what a poet tells us, who opposed Dionysus with heroic valor throughout a long life, in order finally to wind up his career with a glorification of his adversary and with suicide, like one staggering from giddiness, who, in order to escape the horrible vertigo he can no longer endure, casts himself from a tower. This tragedy, the Bacchae, is a protest against the practicability of his own tendency. Alas! and it has already been put into practice. The surprising thing had happened when the poet recanted his tendency had already conquered. Dionysus had already been scared from the tragic stage, and in fact by a demonic power which spoke through Euripides. Even Euripides was in a certain sense only a mask. The deity that spoke through him was neither Dionysus nor Apollo, but an altogether new-born demon, called Socrates. This is the new antithesis, the Dionysian and the Socratic, and the artwork of Greek tragedy was wrecked on it. What if even Euripides now seeks to comfort us by his recantation? It is of no avail. The most magnificent temple lies in ruins. What avails the lamentation of the destroyer and his confession that it was the most beautiful of all temples? And even that Euripides has been changed into a dragon as a punishment by the art critics of all ages. Who could be content with this wretched compensation? Let us now approach this Socratic tendency with which Euripides combated and vanquished Aeschylean tragedy. We must now ask ourselves, what could be the ulterior aim of the Euripidean design, which in the highest ideality of its execution would found drama exclusively on the non-Dionysian? What other form of drama could there be, 
if it was not to be born of the womb of music in the mysterious twilight of the dionysian only the dramatized epos in which apollonian domain of art the tragic effect is of course unattainable it does not depend on the subject matter of the events here represented indeed i venture to assert that it would have been impossible for goethe and his projected nausicaa to have rendered tragically effective the suicide of the idyllic being with which he intended to complete the fifth act so extraordinary is the power of the epic apollonian representation that it charms before our eyes the most terrible things by the joy in appearance and in redemption through appearance the poet of the dramatized epos cannot completely blend with his pictures any more than the epic rhapsodist he is still just the calm unmoved embodiment of contemplation whose wide eyes see the picture before them the actor in this dramatized epos still remains intrinsically rhapsodist the consecration of inner dreaming is on all his actions so that he is never wholly an actor how then is the euripidean play related to this ideal of the apollonian drama just as the younger rhapsodist is related to the solemn rhapsodist of the old time the former describes his own character in the platonic ion as follows quote, when i am saying anything sad my eyes fill with tears when however what i am saying is awful and terrible then my hair stands on end through fear and my heart leaps End quote. here we no longer observe anything of the epic absorption in appearance or of the unemotional coolness of the true actor who precisely in his highest activity is wholly appearance and joy in appearance euripides is the actor with leaping heart with hair standing on end as socratic thinker he designs the plan as passionate actor he executes it neither in the designing nor in the execution is he an artist pure and simple and so the euripidean drama is a thing both cool and fiery equally capable of freezing and burning it is impossible for it to attain the apollonian effect of the epos while on the other hand it has severed itself as much as possible from dionysian elements and now in order to act at all it requires new stimulants which can no longer lie within the sphere of the two unique art impulses the apollonian and the dionysian the stimulants are cool paradoxical thoughts in place of apollonian intuitions and fiery passions in place dionysian ecstasies and in fact thoughts and passions very realistically copied and not at all steeped in the ether of art accordingly if we have perceived this much that euripides did not succeed in establishing the drama exclusively on the apollonian but that rather his non-dionysian inclinations deviated into a naturalistic and inartistic tendency we shall now be able to approach nearer to the character aesthetic socratism supreme law of which reads about as follows quote, to be beautiful everything must be intelligible end quote. as the parallel to the socratic proposition quote, only the knowing one is virtuous end quote. with this canon in his hands euripides measured all the separate elements of the drama and rectified them according to his principle the language the characters the dramaturgic structure and the chorus music the poetic deficiency and retrogression which we are so often wont to impute to euripides in comparison with sophoclean tragedy is for the most part the product of this penetrating critical process this daring intelligibility 
the euripidean prologue may serve us as an example of the productivity of this rationalistic method nothing could be more opposed to the technique of our stage than the prologue in the drama of euripides for a single person to appear at the outset of the play telling us who he is what precedes the action what has happened thus far yea what will happen in the course of the play would be designated by a modern playwright as a wanton and unpardonable abandonment of the effect of suspense everything that is about to happen is known beforehand who then cares to wait for it actually to happen considering moreover that here there is not by any means the exciting relation of a predicting dream to a reality taking place later on euripides speculated quite differently the effect of tragedy never depended on epic suspense on the fascinating uncertainty as to what is to happen now and afterwards but rather on the great rhetoro lyric scenes in which the passion and dialectics of the chief hero swelled to a broad and mighty stream everything was arranged for pathos not for action and whatever was not arranged for pathos was regarded as objectionable but what interferes most with the hearer's pleasurable satisfaction in such scenes is a missing link a gap in the texture of the previous history so long as the spectator has to divine the meaning of this or that person or the presuppositions of this or that conflict of inclinations and intentions his complete absorption in the doings and sufferings of the chief persons is impossible as is his likewise breathless fellow-feeling and fellow-fearing the esclio sophoclean tragedy employed the most ingenious devices in the first scene to place in the hands of the spectator as if by chance all the threads requisite for understanding the whole a trait in which that noble artistry is approved which as it were masks the inevitably formal and causes it to appear as something accidental but nevertheless euripides thought he observed that during these first scenes the spectator was in a strange state of anxiety to make out the problem of the previous history so that the poetic beauties and pathos of the exposition were lost to him accordingly he placed the prologue even before the exposition and put it in the mouth of a person who could be trusted some deity had often as it were to guarantee the particulars of the tragedy to the public and remove every doubt as to the reality of the myth as in the case of descartes who could only prove the reality of the empiric world by an appeal to the truthfulness of god and his inability to utter falsehood euripides makes use of the same divine truthfulness once more at the close of his drama in order to ensure to the public the future of his heroes this is the task of the notorious deus ex machina between the preliminary and the additional epic spectacle there is the dramatico lyric present the quote, drama end quote, proper thus euripides as a poet echoes above all his own conscious knowledge and is precisely on this account that he occupies such a notable position in the history of greek art with reference to his critico-productive activity he must often have felt that he ought to actualize in the drama the words at the beginning of the essay of anaxagoras quote, in the beginning all things were mixed together then came the understanding and created order End quote. and if anaxagoras with his quote, noosh, end quote, seemed like the first sober person among nothing but drunken philosophers euripides may also have conceived his relation to the other tragic poets under a similar figure as long as the sole ruler and disposer of the universe the noosh, was still excluded from artistic activity 
things were all mixed together in a chaotic, primitive mess. It is thus Euripides was obliged to think. It is thus he was obliged to condemn the drunken poets as the first sober one among them. What Sophocles said of Aeschylus, that he did what was right, though unconsciously, was surely not in the mind of Euripides, who would have admitted only thus much that Aeschylus, because he wrought unconsciously, did what was wrong. So also the divine Plato speaks for the most part, only ironically, of the creative faculty of the poet, in so far as it is not conscious insight, and places it on a par with the gift of the soothsayer and dream interpreter, insinuating that the poet is incapable of composing until he has become unconscious and reason has deserted him. Like Plato, Euripides undertook to show to the world the reverse of the, quote, unintelligent, unquote, poet. His aesthetic principle that, quote, to be beautiful everything must be known, end quote, is, I have said, the parallel to the Socratic, quote, to be good everything must be known, end quote. Accordingly, we may regard Euripides as the poet of aesthetic Socratism. Socrates, however, was that second spectator who did not comprehend and therefore did not esteem the old tragedy. In alliance with him, Euripides ventured to be the herald of a new artistic activity. If, then, the old tragedy was here destroyed, it follows that aesthetic Socratism was the murderous principle. But in so far as the struggle is directed against the Dionysian element in the old art, we recognize in Socrates, the opponent of Dionysus, the new Orpheus who rebels against Dionysus. And although destined to be torn to pieces by the maenads of the Athenian court, yet puts to flight the overpowerful god himself, who, when he fled from Lycurgus, the king of Edenai, sought refuge in the depths of the ocean, namely in the mystical flood of a secret cult, which gradually overspread the earth. End of chapter 12 Recording by John Van Stan, Savannah, Georgia This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.